Good morning, and you're very welcome to this morning's live. Uh, this morning, we're going to chat about antiques and how to introduce old pieces into your home, even if your style is more contemporary. So, you know, a lot of people feel that to have antiques, you need to live in a period home, you need to have more of a traditional style, but it's not the case. I mean, we've worked on so many projects where we have maybe restored a period house, um, added quite a contemporary extension, and just sort of blended the two styles. And then that follows through with the furniture and the pieces uh, that we introduced. So it's a topic that lots of you have been asking us to cover. Um, lots of you have been tackling some restoration projects as well, which is wonderful to see. So I'm delighted this morning to be joined by Niall Mullen um, of Niall Mullen Antiques. So Niall is going to shed uh, some light and all his experience um, and everything you need to know, really, whether you're interested in buying antiques, looking after and um, restoring antiques. So I'm just going to invite Niall now to join me. And we did get some great questions as well, so we'll do our best to answer them. And please do. Uh, hi, Niall. Morning, Denise. How are you? Very good. How are you? I'm not too bad. I'm not too bad. You've come in sideways, Niall. Oh, Can you turn, okay. it, turn it around? Yeah. So we... There okay. you go. Now you're... Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Listen, thank you so much for joining me this morning. Great. Great to be here. Yeah, great. Are you in your, your shop? This morning. Where else, where else could I be talking about <laughs> antiques? I have to be here with all the wonderful things. Yes. yes. No, I mean, my goodness, because you, you uh, sent me some fabulous photographs, which, which I'll share now as, as we're chatting. So you've got, it is just a, a treasure trove of amazing uh, bits and pieces that you have. It, it's, it's a fabulous job you have, actually. You know, well, the, the things you no, get to see. No day is ever the same, Denise. That's one thing about the antiques business. Really? Every, yeah. every single day is different. Some can be quite frustrating, but some days you have great, great fun yeah. searching and seeking. And that's what it's about. It's the find. It's not the selling. It's the finding. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what you uncover as well, you know, and it's, yeah. it's just incredible. So I suppose, Niall, if somebody was thinking about starting, you know, they don't know anything about antiques, what, what would your advice be for somebody just starting out? Um, I think, Denise, the big thing nowadays is probably about knowledge. And for years and years, everybody used the word investment when it came to antiques and most things that were bought. And you have to quash that word. That's, that's out of the equation. You have to go and buy things that you like. Mm. And then, of course, it's about budget. So yes. if you were to yeah. say, we're, we're a young couple and we're starting out and we want a table and chairs. So you can go and buy something in the mid-century that's teak. It's not rosewood, so it won't be that expensive. You go to an auction, you buy something that's oak, and that kind of furniture will last forever and ever. Yes. It, yeah, it will yeah. take the wear and tear of daily life in a house. Very fine antiques probably won't, your mahoganies and your rosewood. So that's what okay. I would do. I mean, one of the big programs at the moment, and it wouldn't necessarily be alluding to um, cheap antiques, is Drew Pritchard on Savage Hunters. And you can okay. see what he's doing, and, and the kind of certainly what the big trend is, is the reuse of objects that were once deemed yes. to be you know, certainly gone out of fashion have now come back into fashion. Kind of what we call the haberdashery kind of effect. Yeah. You see that yeah. particularly in the trendy places where they reuse things. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think there is the Antiques Roadshow. There are um, obviously Drew Pritchard. And then most antique dealers and auction houses have good websites. So yeah. Yeah. you can log on and have a look. Most of us give good descriptions, dimensions and price. Mm -hmm. And the same in the auction. And as I've always said, you can go in there at 100 euros and after that it's up to yourself yeah no it's brilliant advice and i think your point about um thinking about your lifestyle and the practic practicalities of what you're choosing as well so is it an everyday piece is it more for occasional use and just take all of those things into account that's really good i, I, think, I think one of the, the fundamental changes in life in the last 20 years and i think most people will remember their parents probably going off and doing things on saturday Mm -hmm. on a Sunday, as opposed to parents nowadays tend to be running after their kids. So they don't have the time to go and possibly walk down France Street, go to an auction as parents once did, and they bought a chest yeah. of drawers or a coal scuttle or a chandelier. Mm -hmm. Now I think there's a bit more instant gratification where people say, we need a pair of lockers for the bedroom, we need a wardrobe, and they go to a retail park or they go online and they order it, not mm -hmm. with any sense of um, heritage, not really sense of quality, just because they haven't got that much time and they want it done. There is an alternative. 
and I would ask people to possibly investigate it. And mm -hmm. maybe the COVID uh, pandemic has given people to probably, they, they may have more time than they once had to seek out alternatives and they are there. And I'm very aware, Denise, that in many cases, antiques don't suit certain environments where mm -hmm. you need to be in your sitting room, sitting on a nice comfortable couch, an antique might not suit. But there are plenty of places where antiques will suit. And I think that we spoke about it during the week a little bit, that I mean, the price element is, it's a bit of a misnomer that mm. antiques are all expensive. I actually mm. would contend in certain cases that antiques would be far cheaper than um, what you would buy in a contemporary or a brand new shop. And I'm not talking about the high end. And I go back really? to- Oak. Yeah, well, oak as an example, Denise, there's always mm. been a snobbery element against oak. Nobody knows the English love oak. You can just think of King Charles and the big oak table. We're not mm -hmm. great on oak. We don't know why that is. And it's a wonderful, hard-wearing timber. It will take more wear and tear than anything else. Mm -hmm. Yet it doesn't particularly sell. Auctioneers will go to houses and they'll say to people, they might have a dining table with six chairs. I can't really sell that. But I mean, you could buy something like that sometimes for two, 300 euros at an auction and it will last for years. And yeah. then you pop it up and done deal in 15 years. And you sell it for something. You, yeah, you'll get your money back probably. I would you think. will get your because yeah. everything will everything will come full circle of mm -hmm. that. We know that. I mean, the sustainability argument, which we may talk about later, will come into play, where mm -hmm. people know that currently, when you go and buy certain products, you know that they are not going to be going to your next house. They get relegated to a den, to a shed, and eventually into a skip. And that's mm -hmm. something. Again, it goes back to people are time poor. So they don't mm -hmm. maybe have the time to go and seek something a bit better. Whereas mm -hmm. with the antique, you certainly will be able to, and again, possibly hand it on to the next generation. Exactly, which is yeah. something that I love the idea of. And I think we were chatting as well during the week. I, I just skimmed an article that was, um, it was saying how things just aren't made to be repaired anymore. You know, and I remember my mum as a kid was fixing everything. Like she's still brilliant at fixing things. But now, literally anything electric comes with a warning, don't even think about opening this up, you know. So apparently over the last six months has been an outcry about this, that like, why? Why is nothing, you know, made to be fixed anymore? And I think this comes back to the antiques as well, because, you know, you can continuously repair them. Um, it's, it's a very simple word, Denise. It's called capitalism. It's as simple yes. as that. I'm sure that Apple could make an iPhone that could last for five years, but why would they do that? They want it to get clogged and slow so you will upgrade. And it's the same with, I'm sure everyone knows the story about bulbs when they were invented in Germany. They actually never blew. And then all of a sudden the German company said, well, if they don't blow, we'll never sell more. So they decided to put a little thing that eventually the bulbs would blow and people were forced to change their bulbs. I That's didn't a true know story. That. that is a true really? story. Yeah, so wow. I mean, I think, I, think when, I think when you have a, a public listed company that is selling sofas, why would they make a sofa that's going to last for 20 years? Because if they do, you know, if that's done, eventually the market can become kind of full, full and they mm. don't get new customers coming in. So we all have sat on a, on a couch. We've all gone and got a, a piece of paper and wedged it into a table or into a chest of drawers to stop it from breaking open. Do you know what I mean? Mm. One of those flat pack ones. Mm -hmm. But eventually they do give, and that's part of maybe convenience furniture, where, of course, yes. the maker of those products, they want you to come back. And mm. certainly the disposable market as you alluded to, is, is a very dangerous thing if you believe that we are on the wrong path environmentally. Certainly, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's a known stat that a Georgian chest of drawers has a 16 times lower carbon footprint than a contemporary chest of drawers. Wow. That's known because it's made, it was made 200 years ago, the timber was cut, whereas mm -hmm. when they're cutting timber now and they're transporting it to China or Indonesia and they're making it and then sending that piece of furniture here, the air miles that are built up it gives it a 16 times higher carbon footprint. And then as you alluded to, we know in most cases, not all of course, that that mm -hmm. chest of drawers will not be here in 10 years time. It will end up in landfill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there, no, there is, there is, it's a fundamental issue where we need to decide what we want. And again, it, it is the balance. I understand that, you know, obviously there are certain things that you must buy brand new for your home, just for, for living, for busy lives. But mm -hmm. I would ask you to step back and maybe just, just t take a rain check when it comes mm. to certain pieces in the house, they don't need to be brand new, coming out of a box with styrofoam blowing around the garden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, 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 it's, it's a brilliant point, really brilliant point. And I know myself, like we've picked up a few pieces. Now they're more vintage, they're mid-century, um, but just the kind of style that I like. But they have been with me for as long as I can remember and they will continue to be, you know, whereas there's other bits and pieces that you'd probably never even consider again. You know, you just uh, get rid of them. So. They have history. That's what I like about them. You know, there's a story behind them. 
I specialise in Art Deco, Denise, which I decided 20 years ago when I my own. I just thought that the, what they call the brown furniture market was full with mm -hmm. dealers. So I decided I would follow my passion and go for Art Deco. And people mm -hmm. who know my stand from the RDS or who come into my shop and it's highly restored at a very, very high level. And they ask a question, how do I know it will last? And I always say, well, it's lasted 90 years so far. And with the conservation job that we have done on it, certainly it's going to last for at least 90 more years. Unless you put it out in the garage or in a sunroom where it's going to be exposed to sun, it will last. And there's a very, there's a very fundamental reason. And it's something, it's, it's all about evolving. The timbers that were used in antiques that were made 200 years ago, 100 years ago, were very different to the timbers now because the forests were growing for hundreds of years in the new world. And they started cutting those trees down and mm -hmm. they were very mature and they came to these shores in England and America and they made furniture that's mm -hmm. of a different caliber. Those timbers are not available. The piece behind me here, not the blonde timber, but the red timber is called Rosewood. It's real mm -hmm. rose from South America. That timber is extinct, unfortunately, because oh, they've yeah. cut most of the yeah. forest down. But when mm -hmm. that timber came in here 115, 200 years ago, it was the best timber. And that is why antiques will last, because when they were making them, they were making them with the assumption that they were here forever. They yeah. weren't making them with the assumption that there was going to be uh, a change. Now, they always knew that styles would evolve, and that's what's happened. Styles have evolved, and certain things have fallen out of fashion, and certain things have come back into fashion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it's so true. And then you, you were saying to me that... Um, there's, I don't know, you'd read an article or something saying that in 50 years time, the whole passing things down to the next generation will have stopped completely. And that's a very scary thought, you know, that we won't be passing things down forevermore, remembering that particular chair that we used to sit on when we were kids or, or things like that. Do you think that's true? Or do you think the last six months has started to, that there's been a bit of a shift maybe that perhaps that might not be the case? What, what well, are your thoughts? I think if there's a silver lining on, on the, on the COVID-19 pandemic, it might be that people have actually taken stock yeah. or, or as the case may be, be not taken stock because they've looked around their homes and they've realized while it is full of items, mm -hmm. there is nothing that possibly has come from their parents. And that goes back to the core. I would be asked maybe on three or four times a day to come and value stuff. Now you can be a busy fool. Mm -hmm. So I could drive to Kalini and I could tell the people, I'm sorry, there's just not much here. Well, the kids not take it. So what I do is I fundamentally say, look, send me an email and I give an indication of what you have. Hmm. And it does come up time and time again that the kids don't want it. They okay. say the kids, yeah. They, yeah. They, wouldn't, they wouldn't take a present of it, is often said to me. Now, there's a couple things going on. Number one, they may live in smaller homes and they don't yes. want a large case coming in the door. And hmm. the other element is that they possibly don't want to change the environment of their house by saying, look, we have a certain style. We've gone for the French colonial paint. We've gone for the grey kind of contemporary look. That, that one can see, and I, I don't want to stray into controversy, but there is a bit of a sameness going through. You can see it there where people are getting a certain look from the magazine and they're going for it. And it goes back again to being time poor. They want it done and they necessarily don't, don't want to go around seeking individual items. So there has been a change in people handing down from generation to generation. And that BBC article did say, I think it was Scandinavian based, that there is a chance in 50 years that when people die, there will be nothing left, maybe apart from money or apart from property, there will be nothing mm. left on a piece of furniture, on art, on jewellery, that people are not going down that route. Mm. Fundamentally, you asked me about the COVID. Yes, of course, people have been on Zoom calls. And I'm sure people have said to certain people, I can't believe you're sitting behind that or in front of that MDF bookcase. Would you not get something decent or a nice piece of art or something? <laughs> so when, when the lockdown stopped in June, we were you know, living in fear because normally in the summer in Francis Street, we would thrive on American tourists who come over and they come from a certain part of America and they stay in the really good hotels and they come down here in a, in a urban fashion and they buy stuff and ship it back. And okay, we knew this year, yes. they, they weren't going to be here this year. Gonna, was, yeah. And they might not be here for another two years because they will, they will take their time before, you know, coming back on a plane, et cetera, et cetera. So we were saying, well, what's going to happen this year? Mm -hmm. So Irish people came out in their droves looking for pieces because they had sat in their homes for three or four months and they looked around and thought, oh my God, we don't have anything. Or we have that sideboard since we got married 50 years ago, or let's do something because they just actually, for the first time, they had time to analyze their home and realized that maybe it needed a change. Yeah. They would normally be gone for the summer to the west of Ireland or to the Algarve and they didn't get that opportunity. So they came down Francis Street and there was like a little mini boom. 
Now, it lasted only for a while and then it died again. But fingers crossed for the 3rd of December, they'll be back out again looking for something for Christmas. For Christmas. No, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I guess, you know, you mentioned the Zoom calls and the, the working from home. Have you seen an increase in office type furniture? Um, people looking for that because desks are actually that is one antique piece that a lot of people even if they live in a very contemporary home they like the idea of an older desk I very um, much De desks have always held their value because if you think of Dublin 246 and there's office you know where you are as an example they yeah. tend to be uh, Regency or Georgian buildings so people solicitors barristers they tend to go for good desks so they've always been sought after but mm -hmm. certainly what I've seen is younger people who are obviously working from home have decided that they're going to go and invest in a good desk. So yeah. it, has been, it has been great. Desk furniture, desk chairs, all that kind of stuff has been really great. The demand has pent up because people do appreciate that maybe the alternatives are not brilliant when you go out into the, into the modern market. When you go yeah. out to the contemporary market, there's not a massive option on desks, whereas you get a good antique. And obviously, all antiques aren't good, but you get a good antique desk or a good Art Deco desk or mid-century. They're fabulous. They're mm -hmm. made to last. They have character. They have storage. Do you know what I mean? You know, they're comfortable. So people have definitely, it's been great on that, on that front. And desk chairs as well. Mid-century more so than antique. Amazing. And, and are they easy to get now? Because I know for a while it was almost impossible to buy um, any kind of home office furniture in any of the, the more high street uh, stores. So it, it, it's yes, we, we all have desks and but probably what's, what's happened, Denise, is that like most antique dealers have warehouses with, with things, we call them possibly mistakes or maybe I shouldn't have bought that. So we, we've all gone back to our warehouses and we've taken things out that possibly, you know, there was a, a period there where certain antiques weren't in fashion. Um, and we've gone back to warehouses now, sideboards, cabinets, consoles, desks, chairs. So we've all been hoking out things and getting them restored over the last four months. Isn't yeah. that brilliant? It's wonderful. Yeah. And then something which I think is, you know, any home could have, regardless of what the style is, is the cocktail or the drinks cabinet. Because I mean, and I know, you know, that's the only option now. And, and the amount of people that I know that are putting in bars, makeshift, you know, sort of bar areas in their homes. And that's such a beautiful thing to invest in. It, it is. And obviously, specializing in Art Deco, I've, I've had through my hands some of the most amazing. And I, I have had this week alone five inquiries about cocktail bars that are sold. Really? And they yeah. say, can I get one? And I'm trying yeah. to say, I can't ring up the warehouse and order those again. So yeah. We, yeah. we have hit the, the crux in relation to cocktail cabinets because it's not that I'm not seeking them. I just cannot get them anymore like I once did. And mm. if people look at my website and go into the vault and see some of the cocktail bars that I've handled over the years, they are fantastic. Cocktails are very much an Art Deco um, iconic thing. They were something mm -hmm. that came about at that time. It was kind of a, a reaction to prohibition. That's where it came from. And people wanted to have the cocktail parties at home because obviously you couldn't drink. I'm talking about the States, obviously. Of course. Yeah, you, yeah. You, couldn't, you couldn't drink in bars and pubs because of yeah. prohibition. So they made these wonderful cocktail bars and a lot of them, they looked quite discreet on the outside. So when your boring neighbours were in, they were closed up and it looked like a cabinet. And then when the boring neighbour left, you opened it up and you can see the mirror interior and possibly a rotating front and all that kind of stuff. And yeah. I mean, like, yeah. again, not to stray into controversy, but people often wonder why when you pull out the middle slide, is it merge? That mm -hmm. was for cocaine use. And, really? and people say, you're kidding me. In 1930s, you could buy cocaine <laughs> in Harrods in London. Really nice. Okay, yes. Wow. Yes. So that, that, that is why I won't even, I won't even go into, because it's early in the morning, where the word cocktail <laughs> comes from. Um, so I'll tell you about it again. But it was about a reaction to prohibition, like everything wow. else. People did yes. not want to be suppressed. And the cocktail furniture was a reaction to that. And it was about Very building. Nice. And it's amazing now, here we are 90 years later, and people are being locked in because of COVID. Yeah. And yeah, they're, yeah, saying, yeah. they're saying, I want to get a cocktail bar. So when... I entertain or can at least I have something in my own home. Yeah, it's fantastic. And actually, so what I'm going to do is pull up some uh, of these amazing photos. What I loved were the before and afters actually now were just incredible. Um, like these chairs here. Yeah. Uh, maybe you could describe. So what, what well, that, era are these an English, It's an English Art Deco um, walnut suite. And we kind of refer to that back as a cloud back. And you can see there, that's Christopher polishing them. So um, they came into my shop, as you see them there, and yeah. my intention was to restore them and cover them in green or black hide. And a couple mm -hmm. from Galway came in just before lockdown and put their eyes on it. 
and they bought it and I delivered it, okay. um, I have to say boldly. And you can just see around the edge of those chairs, there was a burr maple and they've done that around the edge just cleverly because it's a slightly harder timber than walnut. And it just okay. means that there's just that more durability in relation to when the chairs have been used. But mm -hmm. again, they are 90 years old. And when you look at the way they have restored, they chose the, the color of hide. I would have gone for a, maybe a black or maybe a cream because it's a bit more art deco. But I mean, okay. when, I, when I, they, they, they paid me a deposit and I delivered it uh, in the darkness of night during the first lockdown because they were getting a bit of a wobble about it. And I drove to Galway and I lifted it out and they just could not believe the transformation. Yeah, they're, they're absolutely beautiful. Yeah. I mean, they really are. It, it's, it's incredible. They're like new. You know, how it's like new. And there was eight chairs. Denise, it's quite nice. You have two carvers. And you can see we finished all the upholstery with, with either double piping, which is a wonderful little trick because it hides the divide between the timber and the fabric. You don't okay. see that. That's really, really. And it's difficult because upholstery is the most technical as you would know, it's the mm -hmm. most technical of the restorers. And again, we kind of alluded to it. We, we have lost possibly many, many of our great craftsmen because yeah. most things, again, are either not made here or there's a mass production element. But Richie, you know, goes back and you've seen some of my posts on Instagram where he mm -hmm. actually all the original springs and everything is tied down properly. So when you sit on a chair that's posted by the guys, there's no uncomfortableness, no unevenness. It's just great. And then we use the chrome studs just to embellish at the top of the leg there. It's, it's yeah. great. And uh, they, have, they have three young boys and I know that there'll be a fight over that suite in, in many years to come as to who's getting it because that is timeless. If you were going out to, you know, uh, possibly design a suite of furniture that would suit contemporary living, that is the kind of suite that you would, would design. But one of the, the amazing things about it is that suite was 12,000 euros. Yeah. You, couldn't make, you couldn't make that suite for 12,000 euros. That suite to make, because I got a price, would cost 25,000 euros. My goodness. Yeah, well, because, exactly. The quality of the materials and well, to yeah, make the craftsmanship. Eight chairs, yeah, to make eight chairs and a table is, you know, it's nine pieces of furniture. Chairs are very, very technical. You, know, you have to have everything bang on because they can't be uneven. Mm -hmm. They can't be crooked. They have to match exactly. And mm -hmm. to get the timbers, it goes back to that. And you can see around the edge of that, the glorious grain in those timbers. And that's why Art Deco has a high finish. It's called a burnish at the very end. And that is to try and raise the, the density in the grain so you can see it. So people often ask me, is Art Deco made from solid timber? It's not. The, the chair back that you can see there, if you look mm -hmm. down the middle, is mm -hmm. divided in two. It's like folded back in itself. So they cut the veneers quite thick and they fold them back in themselves. And that's why Art Deco wow. has wonderful patination and variation in the grains. That's amazing. Wow, yeah. beautiful. And then this chair, which I thought was absolutely gorgeous. So this is the before and then the yes. after is just remarkable. I mean, the shine on that, it's beautiful. Really yeah. beautiful. They, they, were the, they were the last item I bought before lockdown because uh, a guy pulled up. It was, the, it was the week that Leo was about to announce the shutdown and he, and he appeared at the door and I said, no, I'm not interested. And he said, I'm an unusual chair. I said, I'm not, I don't care what you have. The crown jewels, I'm not interested. So anyway, I went out, I looked at them and I'm probably doing this for between working for my dad years ago when I was at home, 40 years. And I've never, ever seen a pair of chairs like that before. They are about three feet wide. So they really? are quite amazing. They're yeah. arts and crafts. And the lads, there's a wonderful video on my Instagram of the lads doing those chairs because they took them apart and it looked like there was two bundles of sticks in the corner. And then they mm. obviously cleaned out all the joints. That goes back to the caliber of restoration that I would do to make sure that they don't go loose or come loose and that they will last forever. I reposted yeah, in that amazing. burnt orange because that's kind of arts and crafts. But the one thing about those, Denise, I mean, they're not cheap. They're five and a half thousand euros. But mm. I can give a guarantee if somebody buys those chairs off me, nobody else in Ireland has a pair of them. Mm -hmm. I, can mm -hmm. I can guarantee that. That's mm -hmm. how rare they are because I've had people from the UK saying, do you know anything about them? And I've said, no, I don't because I've never seen them before. Wow, amazing! Impressive. Isn't that just amazing? And where did yeah. this? Where did where did they come from now? He he told me he bought them in the north of Ireland. So okay. possibly possibly you're looking at Scottish arts and crafts, which is about about yeah. 1905 in age. Yeah, Scottish arts and crafts. Incredible. Yeah, arts and crafts predates Art Deco uh, by about 20 years. It was the movement that rebelled against Victoriana. So when right. the Industrial Revolution took hold in the UK, they started mass producing furniture. It's funny again how the cycle comes, and mm. certain thought the standards had started to fall. They were just producing furniture for the masses. So there's a movement mm. called Arts and Crafts where they went back to basics 
where they actually went to the fundamentals of cabinet making and using really good timbers. And these are a classic example. Beautiful. No, they're really, really lovely. Really lovely. And just on that point, I mean, you must have seen some of the most amazing houses when you are, you know, sourcing and things like that. Is there anything that stands out and any piece in particular with an amazing story behind it that would have stood out for you or are there just um, far too many for you even to remember? There, well, there, there's lots to remember and, and, I, and I hope I don't bore, bore the story. And on my, go back to my website, there's, there's a cocktail bar. And when I say bar, it's actually a bar that has stools and a bar back and it all goes into itself. It was about four metres long. And I came across it in an auction house in London. And when I got there, it was white, completely white. So I'm not sure, I wasn't sure what the timber was. And seemingly it was pulled out of a house during the war, the bombing of London. And they got it out oh. and they put it into this auction house in London. And I was flying back from Stansted that day and the auction was very, very slow. And I went to the auctioneer to say, listen, I actually, I'm not going to be here. Can I do a phone bid? And he said, mm -hmm. I don't know you. So anyway, he agreed. So I went to Stansted Airport and my phone is going through the x-ray machine and I'm thinking, next thing it rings, and I buy the bar and it comes back and the guys you can see restoring it, it went there and they called me and said, you better come up here and have a look at this. And I thought, oh yeah, more bad news. He says, no, no, come up and have a look at this. And it was just this most spectacular bar back and you push the bar inside it and then the six stools that were chrome went inside the second bar. Now it's fully oh cooked. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's, it's sitting in a house in Kalini and I was invited to the house warming and um, the house was quite big, but mm -hmm. everybody's in this bar and they were asking the guy that owned the house, where did you get it made? Where did you get it made? And he was yeah, laughing yeah. and eventually he, he pointed over to me and yeah, someone yeah. came to me and says, do you, do you make this? And I said, no, no, I said, this, <laughs> this is the real deal. I said, it survived the war. I said, this is the real deal, 1930s. It obviously had been bespoke made for somebody, you know, really important in the UK and had ended yeah. up in storage for years and years. And again, it was the risk, Denise, because again, going back to a warehouse, I have items that I've bought that I've got that phone call to say, look, now there's a problem. This piece has too many issues and it's consigned to the warehouse. This one just happened to work out and it was by far the best piece I ever had. Isn't that incredible? And, yeah. and now there it is enjoying a whole new lease of life. You know, it's, it's oh, wonderful. Very much. Really, really wonderful. And this, so will amazing. Be, this, this will last forever and ever. And there, there will be an almighty fight over this because, as I said, it is just the best fun. And it actually, not only that, but it actually, apart from looking so cool and funky. And I mean, again, you're going back 90 years and it shows you where the modernity came from. It was that reaction to the arts and crafts, Art Nouveau, which is like when you think of Art Nouveau, you think of the metro stations in Paris or yeah, yeah. Uh, Prague, where you have that wonderful organic flowing. Art Deco mm -hmm. was a reaction to that, where they started using modern materials like shagreen, which is stingray or chrome. The first time we saw chrome was in the Art Deco period. Mm -hmm. So it was a reaction to maybe the Germans with the Art Nouveau. The French wanted to maybe just make things a bit more sexy. And you have this mm -hmm. bar that was made 90 years ago where they have cantilever stools made from chrome that sit inside this bar that's mobile. And this is all three meters long and it then pushes inside the bar. The top doors open back on a kind of cantilever effect. So, I mean, they were doing things 90 years ago that I think we possibly could struggle to do today. Yeah, that's really amazing. Front, yeah, so it's amazing and it has lasted and stood the test of time. Mm -hmm. No, so wonderful, really, really wonderful. And then there's another, this fabulous sideboard now. So this is the, the before. That's, not a side, that's actually oh, a, head, a headboard. Oh, that's a headboard, is it? Oh, gee. And so is this it then? That's it restored. That's a headboard. Yes. Oh my yeah. goodness, isn't it beautiful? Wow. That and it's is incredible absolutely beautiful. because we all remember when we were kids, our parents bought single beds and they had these kind of geeky um, headboards at the back that kind of rattled, do you know what I mean? And ended up getting turfed out because they didn't connect properly. And there, if you look at that and the legs going down, you can see there's a little groove in it. That was made in 1930 to connect to the back of a divan bed. So again, it um, goes yeah, back to modernity. Yeah. It has that stepped effect. And if you look at the section there in the middle, Denise, you can see the grains. I refer to it, how they get the pattern. It's the folding of the veneers on itself. And you can see in the middle, it's like butterfly-esque. And yeah, that's bur, bur, bur walnut. And then up top, you can see a kind of a lighter color. That's straight grain walnut. And they put that strip in just to give it a bit of distinction and geometric design. Mm -hmm. And somebody really came into my shop just before I am locked down and, or no, sorry, it's about three weeks ago. And they looked at the headboard as you saw it first and mm -hmm. thought, that's quite nice, but how do I know that it'll turn out nice? And I said, well, look it, I'll give you a money back guarantee. I said, in fact, don't pay me. I said, let me restore it and I'll drop it up to you. So one Saturday evening, I dropped it up. And I think the word she used was, is it definitely the same piece? <laughs> so, yeah, 
it's yeah, and it's remarkable. It is absolutely remarkable. It's beautiful. And now we got a question um, from a lady. So she has been given a gift of um, a dining table. Okay. And she's just wondering about restoring it. So she sent me a photo. It's a picture of it there. So she'd like to have a go at restoring it herself. Any advice? What products should she be using? What would you recommend? Um, probably if she's Dublin based, um, I would go to MRCB, which is in Corn Market, oh. Christchurch. Yeah. Yeah. They're great there. And they would um, advise her. So the product she's looking for is probably Nitromores. You have to oh, wear, yes. yeah. no, listen, this is COVID stuff. No, you have to be masked up and gloves because Nitromores is quite dangerous and you will take off all of the old polish. That, okay. split, that, that split down the middle should not be as prominent. So it needs to be re-glued. And if it's a split that's happened that wasn't meant to be, you have to create a butterfly underneath, which basically brings back the two pieces together. That is quite technical. You also see at the front of the rim there, Denise, there's a piece missing. There's if that's not there, missing. yeah, if she has that piece, it can be glued back on again. Um, good quality glues. And then it's probably looked like it's mahogany. So you're looking like a button polish. The likes of MRCB would have that. But that is not, that's not straightforward to do that. Do you know what I mean? Like she okay. could be looking for the Late Late Show entry on that one. Um, there's a lot of work because that table, you can see the marks on top, that table was in a house and has been used and abused every day. But yeah. it's, it's dating about 1860. It is worth doing. It's yeah. definitely worth yeah. doing, so it is. But no, if, she wants, if she wants to email me separately, I can certainly, you know, maybe try and help her. If, if yeah, that that'd, be, that'd be great. No, because she does, she, she intends to use it as their kitchen dining table, which is fabulous. Great. So, you know, it's, it's, it's for every day. So definitely worth uh if that's, doing if that's well. the case denise i would say do not give it a high finish try try and go for a more waxy finish because if you go okay. for a high finish it's more susceptible to scratches and wear and tear whereas of if you course. go for a drier finish do you know what I mean it means that if somebody puts something hot down on it it won't yeah. have such an impact whereas if you put layers of polish on it and something hot goes on it or course, people yeah. or something yeah. falls on it it will the scratches yeah. will be more prominent yeah 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 no 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 that's that's great advice fantastic brilliant and then just finally, Niall, um, you know, I think what's most fascinating that when we were chatting during the week was what you were saying about online and just how the last six months has changed the way people are behaving when they're, they're shopping and just the increase that you're seeing of online activity with antiques um, and particularly the older generation who sort of found this new liberation in being able to connect and purchase and things like that. And I just think that that's wonderful. Yeah, it's, it's very, very strange, Denise, because fundamentally the antiques business and auction houses were about the physical viewing and the, like we, we love walking yeah. down front. We love going to the auction and that has been taken away from people. So yeah. you had two choices, either you just didn't buy or mm -hmm. you actually went and, and embraced the, the new way, which is online buying. Mm -hmm. And people have done it in droves. So any of the auction houses that have had auctions during lockdown and I'm going back to March, it has been very, very successful. And there's a couple of massive examples, and one is at a high price, and one is not. Last week, there was a Paul Henry painting sold in Dublin too, for four hundred twenty thousand euros. And wow. again, there was no physical viewing. The fees on that was a hundred thousand. So there must have been multiple people bidding. But yesterday there was a sale in Cabin, and they had a rare saddle rack for holding saddles, and it made three thousand before fees, and it's going to Canada. So Incredible. It, it just yeah. shows you that there are people yeah. all over the world who have money who want to buy things. Mm. And the prices have risen across the board on everything from gold, from jewellery, from art, the art market. Oliver Gormley was saying that his business has been up this year despite no exhibitions. I This week I sold that beautiful bronze that I sent you to the UK. Again, somebody was in the UK looking for a bronze by a certain sculptor and he came to my site. I sent him a condition report and he bought it. So it, it is changing dramatically. And mm -hmm. the auction houses, a lot of them who would have been traditional and wouldn't have had websites or condition reports have been forced down that road. But it is mm -hmm. an amazing boon for them because mm -hmm. all of a sudden, it's not just the people who live locally who are mm -hmm. going to their auction. When mm -hmm. you have people from Canada and Australia and Cork and, and Derry, Mm -hmm. looking at your objects it all of a sudden it takes it to a different stratosphere oh my goodness so, it's, it's yeah it's a whole new world it's, it's incredible i mean and i i would quite simply say it's, it's a fundamental advice i i'm vice president of the iada so that everyone has a code of practice so if you're buying something you just must ask all the pertinent questions whether mm -hmm. it's from a dealer now with a dealer if i say it's an art deco uh, desk made from walnut that's what it is on the receipt mm -hmm. there's no 
wriggle room in that. So when you're buying at auction, there is an element of what we call caveat emptor, which is buyer okay. beware. So if you buy something online and you get it to your house and you say, oh my God, I didn't realize it only had three legs and there was four casters missing and the top was split. And you go mm -hmm. back to the auctioneer and you say, you didn't tell me. They will quite simply say, you didn't ask. So that's, uh, that's because okay. how, can, how can you, if you're going to log on and register to bid in an auction and you bid, the auctioneer who's based in Cavan is not aware that you're based in Dublin thinking of buying the table. So make sure mm -hmm. if you're looking at anything, unless it's a piece of art or something that is straightforward, that you send in a condition report and you ask all of the questions. Is it intact? Is it structurally good? Does it have woodworm? Are there any scratches? Are all the legs intact? Because the mm -hmm. auctioneer will come back and say, yes, 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 no, there's a leg missing, it has woodworm, and then you make the decision not to buy it. So ask those questions so you have no regrets and always, always look at the dimensions. Because something yeah, in a photograph- That's great advice, yeah. Something yeah. in a photograph can look like, ah, that will fit in. The next thing, a courier arrives, this sideboard, and you can't even get it in the door. So mm -hmm. always measure. Do you know what I mean? Wardrobes, yeah. classic, classic case of wardrobe. Do you know what I mean? We buy the wardrobe, next thing, it doesn't come apart. And it comes mm. in the house and it won't go in. And the auctioneer yeah. is not really obliged to take it back. So just always ask those questions. But yeah. there's yeah. great bargains, great diversity. All of the good auction houses in Ireland, they all are online. They all operate through the saleroom.com or Easy Live. I have an auction coming up. I'm selling the contents of La Stampa, the Dawson. Uh, I have okay. stuff from, yeah, so there's 1,200 items from the Dawson Hotel. It's been knocked. So great history in there. I'm sure everybody has had a drink or a bite to eat or stayed in that place. So there's history and there's always auctions coming up that have great history and great stories. So keep mm -hmm. an eye on the Irish Times on Saturday. They do a great advertising um, editorial page in the living section. Fabulous, Niall. Well, look, it's a whole new world, you know, for so many people, but uh, very exciting. And just the fact now that it's, it's so accessible from your own kitchen table. Um, so yeah, uh, amazing, right. amazing world out there to, to explore. And thank you so much. I mean, uh, you could chat absolutely all morning, but uh, I've taken up far too much of your time. So thank Not you all. so much. Great. My, my shop Fantastic. is closed here, so there's, there was no problem. There was no chance of somebody coming in. So somebody walking great, in. Yeah. Great to chat to you. And if people want to get in touch, they can just send me an email or follow me on Instagram. I'm very happy to answer questions remotely on valuations, etc. And try and mix your styles. Buy some pieces for your house that will be handed on to the next generation that can be used. You might get a shock but a nice piece of dark mahogany in your hall with a contemporary painting up over it. Yeah, fabulous. Amazing. Nod, thanks so much. Thanks, Enjoy Denise. the rest of the day. Take care. Bye, bye everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.